that came to our house on Monday. So is that like, but I was 15 minutes away. Oh, geez. I, I went to you, I'm like, I'm wearing oh, my jacket. Does it look a little like I'm ready to leave? <laughs> are, we, are we okay? <laughs> Simply because I'm cold. I'm always cold here. Right. Right here. To the right. Okay. Like George Wallace. Where's Amanda? What? Oh, yeah. It's coming. I'm waiting for the word. He just gave me where? Who's where? I have to wait two seconds. Okay. Oh, you see, it's funny because I saw someone walking up the steps and I thought it was the public works department when I went to the men's room. We're good? Okay. Good evening. I'd like to call the April 27th meeting of the Edison Public Library Board to order. Let the minutes reflect that it is 7.02 p.m. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. As required by the Open Public Meetings Act of 1975, adequate notice of this scheduled meeting has been provided to the public by notices given to the Home News Tribune, Star Ledger, and Sentinel, posted on the library bulletin boards and website, and given to the Township Clerk's Office. Roll call, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, Ms. Krause? Here. Uh, Ms. O'Neill? Here. Ms. Mead? Here. Ms. Pam? Here. Mr. DePasquale? Here. Mr. Patel? Here. Mr. Alcantara? Here. Mr. Romano? Here. And Ms. Massey? Here. Thank you. All right, we have everyone here. Um, all right, I am hoping that everyone had a chance to review the minutes of the regular session on March 14th, 2023. Are there any comments or corrections? Hearing none, uh, we will approve those minutes by uh, unanimous consent. And hopefully you've had a chance to review the minutes from March 14th, the closed session. Are there any comments or questions about those minutes? All right, hearing none, those minutes are also um, approved by unanimous consent. At this time, I would like to introduce Anthony Iovino from McCarty and Iovino Architects, uh, who is going to do a presentation on the concept uh, renovation plan at Maine, at the Maine branch. How are you? Good. Thank you, Pat. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And it's exciting to, uh, to get the chance to talk about this. Um, my office was brought in because we're library design experts. Uh, we do pr predominantly library work up and down the state. Um, I've known Alan for some time as a member, corporate member of the New Jersey Library Association and a sponsor uh, for over 20 years of the conference. So we're immersed into what's happening in library. So um, it's always fun for me to go to a library for the first time because I feel like I walk through the space with a fresh set of eyes the way a patron would see it. And <clears throat> when I went to your building at, at the main, um, it just felt like there's such potential that it's underutilized, right? It, it's, it has an odd problem in that it has more space than it's using, right? I'm, almost every library I go to in our state, they're short on space um, and are struggling to do more with what they have. Um, you have the ability to do more with what you have. And that's what our design represents here tonight. And I want to walk you through what our vision is for that. And, and as I believe you have these plans uh, in front of you as well, I know it's a bit of a distance away. Um, I want to start tonight by talking about the lower level, the way we would walk in, right? Most of the patrons come in from the lower level parking lot, right? 
you have the two entrances, you have the one there, and you have the other main entrance on the upper facing the street. So the way the plan is oriented, is the parking lot is at the top of the sheet. So what we're representing with the color on this sheet are the areas that have, if you will, the major renovation, right? Uh, there are some areas that are minor renovation. Minor renovation would be just changing the carpeting, perhaps painting. Um, the major renovation is where we're moving walls, changing ceiling and lighting, um, really more dramatic changes. But everything we're doing is interior, right? We're not changing load-bearing walls. We're not doing anything uh, on the exterior. Even though, you know, we, our initial concept when we weren't thinking about budget, we were just dreaming. Um, we had more work than this. So you can almost consider this a phase one. Um, and phase two might be uh, some softening of the facade on the outside from the parking lot. We, you know, we talked about maybe adding some green space there. There's a big distance from the last row of parking to the building, enough that you could probably add 10, 12 feet of green space in front of the building. And the sun is from that angle, right? It faces mostly south here. So it would be nice to get some trees and things to add some shade. In earlier concepts, we were even adding more windows on this side. So, so the, we can go further than what we have on this, but this is our first phase concept. So when you enter the building, right now your lobby is basically coming through the security gates and going straight through the sliding doors. What we show here is the lobby expanded by more than twice its size. We have an area for vending. We have a counter where you can come in and just plug in your device without going into the library to charge up. Um, we have some, if you will, deli seating, like two-person tables. The point of this space is for that group, especially the three o'clock crowd that comes to the library, it's almost essentially for vending, right? It's a social aspect. And maybe they're the more disruptive within the library, unintentional, but that's what kids do sometimes. Um, so this gives them a space technically outside of the library proper where they can come in, they could be a little bit more social, rambunctious, they can get their stuff out of the vending machine, and they're not disturbing the people inside the library as much. Right? One of the issues I remember when meeting with all the staff was, Right now, the older kids come in, and, and they make a beeline to the back of the space, and they start running around. And, and any time older kids and the smaller kids mix, it's not good, right? It scares off the, the smaller kids. Um, what we tried to do here was to create defined areas for the older kids toward the front and the younger kids toward the back, and to break down the space. So if, if you try and uh, visualize what you see when you first walk into that library. You see clear across the space and there's no definition, right? It's almost warehouse, right? It's about collecting and storing books. I wanna make it more about people. And what I'm trying to do on both floors, you'll see, uh, I'm, I wanna create a division in the middle. So if in the drawings you see in front of you, in the middle of the space, I have some dash lines that run across. My intent there is to change the height of the ceiling at a point that tells you you're entering something else, right? So that when you're about halfway down, you get through the older kids section, you enter into the younger kids section. Uh, it's, it's a subtle architectural move that really helps define space without putting signage everywhere. Now, some of the amenities that we have are really on the periphery. Um, the biggest thing that you have to do because of ADA requirements is upgrade those bathrooms. And so what we're doing is taking those two single person bathrooms in this area and creating a family lab or a unisex lab, right? Something a little larger for maybe a parent with a stroller uh, and another kid that can come into one room at the same time. Um, a men's and a women's room with two, two stalls in it um, and a staff bathroom at this level. Everything accessible. It has to be by law. So that's, that's a big chunk of what the work is about. That's probably your most intense renovation, right? Everything else is more about furniture, ceiling, and lighting. Um, right now, in the bottom left corner, it's labeled book sale, right? You know, this is a meeting room that you have that's kind of in the private part of the library. I want to bring that out. So 
I'm swapping a storage room that is labeled office in the bottom right. Right now it's a storage room, but to me that's prime real estate. So we're gonna put the office there, put the storage behind the scenes. The programming room is the same size as, as it is now, except I'm going to add a wall of glass. And also it needs a second means of egress because it holds more than 50 people by code. So what I'm doing is I'm putting an egress door here that comes up and can get people out of the building or into the rest of the library. So we're taking care of life safety issues as well. The, um, and we're adding a large storage room at the end of the programming space because the, the library, as big as it is, is short on some of that. Back toward the entrance again, I talked about the lobby. Um, we are putting in um, a book drop room for the automated uh, returns. In the right corner, we have a large, roughly 20 by 20 room for the teens. It could be a maker space, it could be a gaming space, it could be anything you want it to be, but it's a glassed in space that will allow the teens to be a little more vocal without disturbing others as well. And then I've created two small study rooms that, again, are versatile rooms that you don't have right now. Um, so it, it's, it's more about uh, taking away shelving and putting in people, if you will. So it gives the library flexibility to provide different services that you don't right now. Um, any questions on this before I go upstairs? Um, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell me. Okay. Yeah. Um, so with the two studies, um, you have the lobby area where it's going to be a big hangout for kids, mm -hmm. and you have the teens on the other. What are you going to do to soundproof those walls? Because if it's a study room, obviously it needs to be quiet. Right. But you have two loud, possible 100%. loud rooms on each right. side. So do you have soundproofing? Do you to, double to, sheetrock? Do you, yeah. To, to a degree, right? So the, 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 you know, the problem, if you will, with creating a soundproof room out of solid walls is you can't see in. Right. And we need to see in. I think the way, I imagine the way this would be used is um, for the students that need that dead quiet, we have study rooms upstairs we're creating. And I think you take them out of this, or they take themselves out of that environment. I think this is sort of not about this soundproofing, but about maybe isolating yourself a little bit. So I, I also think a lot of the students are less uh, bothered, if you will, by the background noise. If you ever watch a group of students, I, I remember paying attention to this when I was bringing my two sons through college tours. You know, you'd be in a room like this with 50 kids and they're all by themselves with headphones on, right? They right. want to be around other people but by themselves. And I think that's the kind of use I see here that, that uh, if somebody really needs to extract themselves from the noise, they'll go to the adult spaces upstairs. Okay, so it would be really on the staff or the director, whoever's there to kind of right. manage that. In a way, because but I, I could see you getting, you know, People going in there going, hey, it's too loud here, here. What, yeah. what do we do? Right. And, you know, just. But I, but I, I think know. it's, I, I think it almost becomes self-policing. You know, I, I, right. it, it's after somebody uses it the first time, they're going to know the nuances of it. Then they're going to know where I can go to this nook and be in a quiet place. And you'll see upstairs, there's a ton of that. So I think that overall, the building allows for these different personalities to exist. Right. Okay. So. Right. That's all I had. Yep. Hi. Um. I apologize. I've I've been to I've lost count of how many times I've been to the main library, and I never look at it this closely. So, where the lobby, book drop, etc., is that's existing space, right? That's not or is, or is that expansion? It, it's all existing building. Okay, so just next, repurposing. All right. I just I, I, again, it's very hard, you know, because I don't look at it with this kind of eye. Understood. Um, the book drop. That looks really awkward to me. The only way to access this book drop for people to drop off books is to go through that lobby where the, where the kids are hanging out? No, the intent is from, uh, from the exterior. It's for an automated uh, oh, okay. return. I, okay. Right. I did not see that. And then the, the next question is, because that's also, and I don't know if this is just me, but isn't that also a little bit awkward that it's not right by the door? Um, because I know most people, right. it, you know, you look by the door. If it's not by the door, you go yeah, home. Understood. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm smiling because that's how we started. And, <laughs> and then we were debating the arrangement because we wanted to create the space for the teens. The trouble I had with putting the book drop here closer to the door was then I was creating kind of a hidden space 
and it was more about hallway, right? In this arrangement, I get those study rooms out of this as well. And, and again, it's gonna be a mix of policy and architecture, and, and I was saying to Alan uh, before we started, this is so fluid right now, this is initial concept, right? Broad view, and as we dive deeper into this, um, things will change. So th those are the exact things we'll look at more and more, but I think conceptually it's about getting this arrangement of social space, book drop, study space, activity space in this condensed little area. Great. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Was uh, I'm sorry. Was anybody uh, from the library uh, consulted with the design? Was anybody consulted about? Uh, Tony had a great idea with with the noise. Right. I know that that's a that's a I. I remember when I was going to school years ago, like way a long time ago, when you went to a library, a library was supposed to be a, a quiet place, yeah. a calm That's place. just as soon as you went inside, right? And from what I've been, from what I've been hearing, uh, what I'm listening to you, you're telling me that, well, we're trying to take and. <clears throat> Tony talked about, you know, noisy space. Right. Is there a place? I mean, we're making, we're spending a lot of money on this, which is okay. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I didn't hear anything about quiet space. Right. I didn't hear about, you know, I, I understand people sitting around and they got their earphones on, this, that, and the other. But I do know that we have a noise problem in the facilities. Yep. So, and I'm so I'm just no, that's I'm okay. rambling because I haven't heard anything about quiet space. Okay. So so let me let me talk about that then. I you know I'm I'm halfway through the building, but the the point of this, the point of corralling those people and the kids in those spaces is to make the bulk of this quiet, right? Is that we're we're creating places where they can be more social in the lobby. Uh, they could be quieter in the study rooms. They could be quieter in, in this teen activity space, depending on what the activity is. But all the reading tables and such out here would be quieter. Now, no matter what we do, a kid's area is never quiet, right? But the other half of this building is going to be about quiet mm -hmm. and study spaces, right? Just like right now when you go upstairs, it's dead quiet up there, right? Because there isn't anything to cause that loud interaction. <laughs> There's a cafe, but it isn't a loud cafe. It's somebody getting a cup of coffee and sitting down, and you know, it, it's not about a group study. Um, so I understand that concern, and, and I know I focused on, on sort of the social active spaces, but it's creating those spaces that, by default, creates the quiet spaces outside of them. Um, I, I, I'm with you 100%. This isn't about making a loud building. It's about creating places where somebody could be free to, to be social, right? Because, Joe, when, when I was a kid like you, my memory of a library, and, and I, I'll tell this story because I stayed away from library for about 15 years because I remember I had to go. I grew up in West New York. I had to go to the library for a school project. I was a kid. I walked in within five feet. I got shushed, and I hated it. And I did what I needed to do, and I got out of there, and I would never go back. Um, I didn't go back probably till I was 20 years old. Now I live two blocks from the Teaneck Library, so I'm there all the time with my kids. But um, that sticks with me because you shouldn't scare somebody away from the library. You should make them want to come, right? But somebody shouldn't be scared out of the library because I have no place to study because it's too loud in here, right? So I think we're creating, and I think you'll see by the end of this, we're creating all of those spaces where I can come to be quiet and by myself, or I can come to study with a group, or I can come and meet my friends here and not bother somebody, right? Well, oh. sorry, just one, one quick thing. Um, I'm guessing you speak the up, they can't hear you on the tape. I'm guessing the audience wants to see this too, and we all have it on our laptop. So maybe if you like push it back and just face it 
Oh, you have um, it over there. Ro okay. Robbie has the board there. Then yeah. Never mind then. Yeah, and also, I, uh, Joe, you had asked if anybody had seen this. I, I started this process with a meeting with a staff of about 50 people in the room um, for a couple of hours, and we talked about the, the, the needs, and I asked a lot of pointed questions about it. This is probably the fourth, fifth version that we've been through, and we've been back and forth. Uh, quite a bit with it. So I, I, I can't design this in a vacuum. I understand no. libraries, but y your library is unique. Every I, library is unique. I understand that. Uh, I'm with the school board, and we have uh, libraries in all of our schools. Mm. Uh, to be honest with you, some of our libraries now, not in the school, but some of our public libraries are being used uh, I'm going to use the word used. I don't want to use that word uh, for other for other issues, not for a library. Mm. And w when I use Tony as an example, Tony talked about noise dead noise deading or noise calming. Mm -hmm. And at at one point or another, I was going to try to take and say, do we have? Uh, policies, which I'm, I'll talk later about it, uh, not about noise, but libraries is supposed to be a place to study, places to take in to use the internet to, uh, if there's a, an, an issue that you're looking up, at, at certain times, the libraries, which I've been told I have not witnessed, uh, do get, I can't say, I can't say rowdy either, mm -hmm. but. Misused. And, the, and the, the fact of the matter is, is I don't want to take and start complaining about policy, this, that, and the other, mm -hmm. but you're putting a lot into the library, which I'm not arguing. I want this to happen, mm -hmm. but there's no way we have to come up with some sort of noise canceling something to to make it so our libraries are uh, conducive to the public. Yeah. Not just certain public, conducive to all of the public. Right. I where agree. if you walk in and there and there's a ruckus or there's people that are there's people that are using the library to teach other people. That's not what the library was for. So I guess I'm, maybe I'm, I'm not at the right time. But when you talk to me about noise canceling and Tony, with the, yep. I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing what I want to really hear about it. Okay. All right. Let's let, let's get to the second floor, and I think we'll we'll address a lot of that. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, just a quick question on the first floor. How many walls are actually coming down and being uh, put back up? I'm just curious to know how many uh, walls you'll be disturbing. Sure. So we're, all of the walls in this upper right area are new, right? There's one glass wall that defines your current vestibule that comes down. Um, these walls here in the storage room next to the programming room, those are new. These walls along the bottom of my drawing in the programming room, they exist. I'm just going to change one concrete block wall to glass. All of the walls in this area by the bathrooms are new because we're going to take down those. There are two bathrooms in this back area where the women's room is here on the drawing. Those go away. So everything else here in the white, there's no work there. So you're not really disturbing too many walls that's at all? Correct. That's correct. Or that's, demolition. Right. Trying to minimize it. I'm no, trying to be efficient. I, I, I bring that up, sir, is, um, you know, I'm looking at, at, at the cost value here, and, and one of the assumptions you have is asbestos and lead abatement is excluded from That's it. correct. Um, that building was built in the 60s, I believe, and it also expanded in the 70s and 80s, if, I, if my memory serves me right. Mm -hmm. And back then, you know, the, know. the kind of tool or okay. materials they mm -hmm. use. So if you're disturbing these kind of materials, I was wondering, um, but it sounds like you're not really disturbing too many of those walls. Right. I was taking that into consideration and, and having gone to the building a number of times and sort of poked around. Uh, the only potential for that to happen in this whole arrangement, I think, is inside the plumbing walls of those two bathrooms. And that would be so limited. So it really wouldn't be an issue to radically change any pricing. 
Uh, it would be different if you know we were renovating all of this and all of the walls, the plaster had had asbestos, but we're not dealing with that. The ceiling is a you know a lay-in type ceiling that mm -hmm. doesn't have it. So I'm, I'm comfortable saying it's if anything exists, it's absolutely minor. But to to our you know I don't know if anything exists just yet. But that would be as we dive deeper into this. And you know, I guess we will get to that if, if it comes up. But, right. you know, but of course, what comes to my head would be to me. price, price wise, if right. how much that would be on top of this project no, if, you know, nothing. you were disturbing something and it pops out. Next to nothing. If it's it, the worst case to me, it's plumbing wrap at, inside the walls of the bathroom. If it's a $10,000 item, that would maybe be the most. Okay. And, and, you know, I know you're going on to the second floor as yep. well very shortly. How many on the second floor? Bathrooms? Or, no, being disturbed, oh. walls. Oh, oh I'll well, tell you in a minute. Let's go to the second floor, I guess, right? <laughs> so um, would there be any consideration in, or is it possible, to move those study rooms to where the office is next to the mechanical room? Because uh, your, your quiet area is on the other side of the building, which would be a better place for your study. Maybe. Not really. <laughs> not really. Because well, not really. Why? Well, two, two reasons, right, is we don't want the older kids down here. Um, the older kids won't enter into the little kids' zone. Um, the study rooms back here uh, means, you know, you're going to cross-contaminate, if you will, bringing the older kids into the younger kids. The younger kids could be a, a small child having a tantrum. But wouldn't the older kids be able to go upstairs? 100%. That's, that's, that's my point so to a lot of So what I'm saying is that if you had the study rooms in the back, those could be for... With the little kids. But the little kids don't use the study rooms. So there wouldn't be any tutoring with the little kids in the study rooms? That's no, I'm, not, not, I'm talking about the littlest kids. They, that wouldn't happen back here, more toddler and preschool. So the children's area would be up to what age are we talking? What's, what's Alan, what's typically children's like ages? Maybe children's maybe. ages. Is that up to like For, sixth grade or is that? Zero to, I mean, if you're looking at children. The youngest. Okay, so fifth but graders could do tutoring this, in there. This is. Right. Right, but the fifth graders aren't going to use a study room at all for tutoring or anything? No. Okay, I'm just, again, it's just to put study rooms where it's really the loud area, <laughs> to me, it just, it's it just, it doesn't. Tony, it's almost a misnomer, right? So what happens in that age bracket right mm -hmm. now is um, it, it's, the term is used interchangeably in libraries, right? It could be a gaming room. It could be a music room. I was about to yeah, say, you know, yeah, it's, it, it's so, a space so, yeah. that, that we're kind of reserving. Okay. But, you know, we've talked about yeah. um, having a, a music studio yeah. or a video production studio. Okay, it so certainly this, would fit in that space. So the study rooms perfect. are kind of flexible. It, it's a label, right. it's a label yeah, I'm just, issue. I see yeah. study rooms, I, I'm so that's what I'm concentrating that, on. Yeah. That's I, all I'm saying. If it's a flexibility <laughs> for other stuff, that, that, that's yeah. cool. Okay. Okay. No, that, that's fine. Okay. You know, and, and this is what happened, and, and we've seen this even in the North Edison branch. Um, if we're looking at, a pre hey, you know, six months from now getting started, right. our, our, we might be changing between now and six months um, new priorities might come up. Something new might be that we like, oh, we really want to do. And now we have a space to do it okay. instead of later going to say, okay, so we need another room and we don't have right. it. No, so fair. that can be flexible rooms. It could be anything right. that okay. we need it to be right. at, at that point when, right. we, when we get to it. Okay, uh, no, that's fine. Okay, going upstairs. Um, same same orientation, parking lots at the top of the sheet. The main road is at the bottom of the sheet. <clears throat> so again, most people entering this level are coming up the stair and elevator that's at the top of the sheet. Um, a certain percent will come in off the street at the at the vestibule. Same logic here. The uh, the areas that are shaded with a color are are major construction in terms of what's new walls. Um, 
basically this core with the director and office and vestibule that exists. Everything else is new walls, right? Because this is one big open space right now in the library. It's all book stacks, and your current cafe is in the bottom right of that sheet. We're going to move the cafe to the top center of the sheet. Um, so in this bottom right corner, we're creating three offices. Um, on the bottom left corner is another office. Right now, you have a large office space that goes almost up to the existing bathrooms that are just defined by book stacks. So it's a noise issue, right? There, there's no privacy there. There's no security there. So what I want to do is, is create a wall that creates this office that'll have daylight, and then, of course, the, the three offices on the right side. What I said earlier about you know, the big open space of, of the library and breaking it down, that's what I'm doing here as well. So the same dashed lines here represent a drop in the ceiling. Just again to say you're going from this space to that space. Um, what happens is, you know, imagining most people coming here, elevator and stair, they come out, they're at the cafe, and then they get into quieter zones as they go into the, toward the bottom right. Um, you have the office, so you can monitor what's happening. The book stacks and low stacks are, are here in the uh, upper part of this page. And then when you come through this point here, we have a group of study rooms. These are truly the more quiet study rooms. So we have five. We have four two-person study rooms and one larger one that can hold uh, 10 people at a table. And that helps define, again, the, the quiet, uh, quiet spaces from perhaps the more lively. But to me, there's nothing loud up on this floor. This is really about study and, and, and you know, reading. Um, we moved the staff lounge that was in downstairs uh, in the back area to up here more centrally located. So we have a little bit more room. Uh, it's really important to have good workspaces for library staff since it's hard to find library staff. It's a decent amenity to have for them. It's not over the top. Um, we looked at expanding the bathrooms on this level as well. Um, it was difficult to do. We can do it, but we pulled back on that for money reasons because we're meeting the code requirements on the first floor. So we meet the ADA requirements. You can have ADA bathrooms on the floor below or above you as long as you have an elevator. And that's the condition we have here. So we meet the code. Um, so what I'm creating then by putting the study rooms here, breaking up the floor, is a quiet reading zone that would be table separated by a low stack. So every table has its own sort of territory, if you will. Um, these could be four-person tables or they could be a series of two-person tables. Um, what happens in a library, if you pay attention to it, is you'll have a table for four, one person will sit at it, and nobody else will sit there with them, right? So, so a lot of times I like to actually have two two-person tables, and you can put them together or you can keep them apart, and you get to sit more people that way. Um, so these zones here would have some supervision from the offices, and also the study rooms would have glass so you can see into them and through them. So there's always implied supervision, right? We don't have a hiding place anywhere. I don't want that to happen. So you can see with what happens here, you know, we still have the meeting room and, and the behind the scenes. We're not doing work there. Um, I, I'm listing this area uh, as carpet only in my estimate. Um, maybe, again, painting very minor renovation there. I'm trying to do that to keep the number down. Um, and again, the, you know, where I'm putting up new walls, new floor finishes, ceiling, lighting, that number's a little higher. Um, and, and I know I think you all have my opinion of cost as well, and, and we'll talk about that in a second. I just want to address any questions you might have at, at this level. Okay, I'll talk about costs. Um, so what I did for the cost, at this very broad level, I'm not going into detail. It's impossible, right? There's so much more to know about what this is. This is the extent of the drawings we have, right? So I can do a square foot calculation. And, and I'm using the major minor renovation for that point. So on my list, I go through, you know, first floor has just over 6,000 of just minor renovation, but 5,000 and change of major renovation. This second floor, the upper floor, has 
about 4,000 of minor renovation. That would be the, you know, this block here in the upper right. And then uh, just over 4,000, almost 4,500 close to it of, of this yellow area of major renovation. When I take those together, plus a couple of minor unique items, you see it in the center of the sheet. Those are in case I have to do any exterior wall work or any site work for that book drop. So I'm just assuming something for right now. Um, when I put all of those together I, and, and I add in escalation, assuming that this isn't happening till early next year, plus a contingency because there are so many unknowns just yet, um, I'm sitting at uh, just over 1.6 million for this. And you know, we've gone back and forth, we as Alan and, and Pat and I, as we've re reviewed this, taking some things away, putting some things in. Uh, again, my first pass was without thinking about numbers. I wanted to find what would be ideal and work backwards from that, right? So again, as I talked about earlier, outside in front of the, uh, the building, when you come in from the parking lot, I would love to change the image of the building, right? To soften it up, right? The building is dated from the outside. And what can we do about that? Well, I would spend every penny you have on the inside first. And I change and improve the services first. And that'll bring people to the library. The image will bring other people to the library. But I, I think it's secondary. So if, if you know, this, this comes in less or we pull back on something or more money is available, then we can start looking at what happens on the outside of the building. Um, but I think this is a reasonable. Uh, estimation, if you notice the, the square foot rate I used for major, I put it a little bit higher on the, on the first floor because of the amount of bathroom work we're doing. Um, I, I'm sort of reverse engineering what that dollar per square foot number is. I was looking at the magnitude of the work at the bathrooms, at like putting the glass in at the programming room, all the rooms we talked about up at the front entrance. And, and it boils down to about 150 a square foot. That's what I'm comfortable with using right now. Sounds high, but it's, it's sort of evening it out um, as you threw out that whole work area. Um, so, you know, understanding the square foot cost in public work, um, those numbers are real. Um, I can tell you, uh, we recently had a bid for uh, Highland Park's renovation, all interior renovation. We were under 100 a foot. So I'm hoping that I'm heavy with these numbers. But I don't want to go in light and come back and say we need to increase this, because that's not a good way to start. This is the start of something. right? You're not spending any of this right now. We need to really refine it and, and digest it and develop it further. Um, but I think it gives you the magnitude of what this project could be about. Any questions? Are there any other questions? I think that's excellent. Yes, Ray. Quick question. Um, uh, great presentation. Uh, just curious, you mentioned something and, and it struck my interest. So you talked about programming and increasing the individuals that come to the library because of these changes. You've done this in, in several other libraries throughout the state. Do you have a metric in regards to you know, out of all the libraries that you did, you did these renovations, do you have a number where you could say the usage of this library went up by 20%, 30%, 10%, whatever it be? Yeah, I, I, I don't have that metric for the libraries, but what I can tell you definitively is two things happen. No matter what the renovation is, if somebody knows it's new, they're gonna go out of curiosity. So there's a spike, right? Um, the second thing happens is whether or not you retain those people. And what we find is that there is a retention. So you, you'll see that number rise. And it really becomes, you know, that's the door. It's up to you to keep them there, right? It's up to you in terms of how comfortable they feel there based on the service as well, right? So it's not just the architecture. It's policy that keeps people around. But there is an absolute increase. Uh, initially, and typically it holds. Yeah, I, I would love to see how this goes further um, as it, it progresses as a project, but you know, um, having conversations with residents um, about the library, the first thing that comes up, of course, is adding more new programming, this and that, and this is not programming for this kind of a hefty uh, price tag. So 
I'd love to see how the project goes moving forward. Um, but you know, the the residents that I've spoken with have all talked about just more programming. Right. And can these resources that we're about to put into something like this, could it translate into new programming, programming that they could use that residents in Edison would be, you know, uh, uh, interested in doing? Um, because like I said, this is a hefty price tag for moving, uh, putting up walls and other things that isn't necessarily programming. So I'd love to see how this project progresses, but right now, you know, I'm just looking at this price tag and saying, it's not a single thing in programming um, for residents in Edison. I, I understand, and and I do believe that what we're creating here is, is you know is a toolkit for the library to provide those services and programming, right? That you can't do in a big open space. That we're giving options to the to the staff to create those programs and services. Um, and again, my my hope here is that that number is high. Um, and until we get more information on this, and you know, you don't have to go so far as having final drawings before you know the number. As we dive deeper into this, we'll be able to refine the number at different stages as we go and decide to pull back on pieces of it or to add something if we think you, you know, we could afford it. I appreciate that. And you know, uh, as it moves forward, I'd also challenge, of course, the library staff to say what kind of programming is going into this. You yes. know, if we're spending this much, yeah. these are the kind of programs we envision going into here. Yeah. So that way there's a fuller plan and, and the fact that, you know, we're building it, yeah. what's going in it. And, and that's important because, you know, every, you know, this is a chance for everybody, the staff and everybody to digest this, right? And think differently, have something to react to now instead of a blank piece of paper. I want that. I want them to think about how they're gonna use this because it, it could inform me and my staff as to what we need to change, right? So a lot of times some of our best projects are the ones that sort of pause a little bit. You know, everybody gets to live with it and try and imagine it um, because you, you, know, you think about it a little differently when you've slept on it, literally. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to hearing the comments as we go along. Just to kind of that on um, kind of what Ray mentioned, just kind of looking at. So we have the the teen center there, and then you have the programs room. Is that program room going to be? Are we going to be able to divide that at all? Because what I'm looking at from what Ray was saying, you have that open space, which is the quiet area. Mm -hmm. The only other spaces you have to do any type of program would be this big programs room in the teens room. So you're not really allowing that much space for multiple programs to happen at the same time, unless you're able to like, say, divide that big programs room. Right. Because well, we, when you go upstairs. Well, um, Tony, don't forget about the, you know, we had the existing meeting room, which is the largest room. We're not touching that. Which, which Our, room is that? Upper left on the upper floor. Right, but that's gonna be for the older teen area. I'm, I'm just saying, in other words, you really want to keep the kids on the first floor. It depends because, on, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt, but it depends on the activity, right? I, I understand what you're saying, right? That if downstairs, if we have, you know, activity with the youngest kids happening in programs, story time and things like that, and it's after three and the teens are, you know, maybe having maker space or right. gaming. If there's another group, we have, the biggest meeting room upstairs, which, you know, at that three to five range, um, it's, you know, the kids are everywhere. You know, you're gonna have the more studious kids upstairs, right? And, and so I think you'll, you'll have the meeting space upstairs, you'll have the kind of board meeting room here that could be for another group. Um, and I think you'll still allow for the quieter pockets and the activity spaces downstairs. Right, but but again, with the programs, can that programs room, can we have that Dividable? dividing walls? Because again, you know, you only have so much time in a day. Understood. So, you know, again, I, I know you can bring the kids upstairs, right. but that just, to me, gets to be confusing. If you want the kids to be on the first floor, yeah. the older kids on the second floor, you know, I, I think we need to just consider like what Ray was saying, is that having multiple programs, because if the residents are, and we heard this at multiple meetings, if the residents are looking for programming and this open space here is not gonna be available for programming, we only have one big room, 
that we can't, at this point, it's not looked at as being divided. We have that teens room, which maybe there should be a room upstairs for the teens. <coughs> like that, that's a, I, I think that would be a concern. We, we don't want to go into this and go, okay, great. We have all this open space, but we really need more separate rooms. Right. And right. Then when you look upstairs, you know, I, I see, you know, we have the big meeting room and then we have that small room, but then we have the study rooms, but then we have a big office. We have the director's office, another big office, assistant director, office and office. My, my question would be is do we, and we might, I'm not, I'm not questioning, but do we need that many offices? Could we turn one or the, two of those into, you know, I, I, that, that's, uh, that's just my, right. my gut feeling uh, is, uh, you know, again, the open space is great. But, again, if the residents are looking for more programs, are we supplying right. the rooms for the programs? Yeah, so, so, the, so you that, know, that's... I think, you know, certainly the kids' programming room downstairs, if we, if we need to, we can subdivide this room. Yeah. Right? That, That's what that, I'm just that can it be done. should be an easy... It's a, just it's a bit of a big ticket item to do it, but it can be done. So that's for, you know, for yeah, me I, to absorb as I, we yeah. go along, right? It's just when I'm, I'm right. processing through here, that's... You and, know. and then to your point, though, yeah. and, you know, with the offices upstairs, depending on staffing need, well, the, the I mean, shape of the offices could be anything. In yeah, the future. again, we might need them all. I'm, we I'm actually just need it them out all. There. We're actually short. Okay. And and one of the earliest discussions was to move all of the offices out of the main building in a different location right. and rent space, like the Board of Ed does, right. which would be a exorbitant cost um, to to the budget. And um, actually, those are probably not even enough offices. Okay. Um, the second thing is, um, we all agree that we need to do more programming. Uh, and just to go back to what Ray was saying, there are different kind of programming. There's programming in which children come into the library and might go to the Discovery Center and sit and play with Legos, which is a way of daddy and mommy or a caregiver, I want to go to the library because I want to play with these massive Lego sets. Um, it's not always story time. Mm -hmm. So we also need to develop in some of these spaces um, these passive programs. And I'll call them passive because you, it, it, they're individual because right. when you come in, you can do what you want. And we haven't, because of the way the space is now, we don't have any room for that. Um, you know, one of the passive programs we have, I don't know if call it passive, is we've got a group of kids every afternoon. These are coming right out of TJ. They head for the children's computers downstairs, the three of them, and every afternoon they're there gaming with each other, competing um, for like half an hour, 45 minutes every day. So they're, they're finding their space within the library. Um, we also really have made a big effort to try to keep the uh, children and teens on the first floor generally during the week, simply because otherwise the second floor, the adults can't study. All the computers are in the open. And, you know, one of the biggest things we get all the time for us is not programming. The biggest request the staff gets for, this, for the main library is quiet study space. Can I, is there a room, is there a room, is there a room? Which is why the rooms at North are always booked. That's what people want. They want that little space with that little enclosure. So um, we really, uh, based on what we can do, we really have enough children's spaces. With a teen room on the corner, which we didn't have before, um, with the program room, um, and we're probably, um, that room next to the program room will kind of become that maker space with a, the, which is why we're putting sinks in there so we can do arts and crafts. Um, we, we can't compete as a library. You don't want to compete with yourself of having four things in the same building at the same time. Right. So you might have something that the, the uh, younger kids do not come in. They come in in the morning with parents they're gone the whole day. They don't come in with their parents until seven or eight o'clock. Now, um, because they're working. 
So they're not there at the same time the teens are there from three to six. So the t that, that's teen time on the first floor, basically. I'll say tween because they're TJ kids. And the second floor is all adults. Yeah. And that's pretty much how the people look. And the teens don't want to go upstairs because they don't want to be the, right. we can't talk upstairs. So in reality, keeping the teens and the children on the first floor um, uh, I kind of make a lot more sense in this building. It's way certainly different at North. The, the children are separated um, by a, um, uh, a wall. Um, that gives some kind of privacy for the children and some security for the children, which is what the parents want too. A little security away from uh, the older kids so that if the kid's running around a little, they can, you know. Right. Um, not run out the door, which is, is, is something why we asked that the, the children's things be further back um, so that uh, we wouldn't have any of those issues. The kids like to run out that front door. Right. I, I would still like to see if we could look at like dividing, because again, we're, we're spending the 1.6 million on what we're looking at now. What's five years, what's 10 years? When's the next renovation gonna be? So I know what Alan is saying we have now, but is there a way to put some flexibility in what we're doing currently? Like that teen room, the office down, that, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm just really concerned about. You know, we don't know when we're gonna get another, you know, whatever funding or whatever it is to make more changes or anything. So being, I'm always a little weary when we're locked into something and we don't have the flexibility. Where again, if we split that room, okay, that gives us two rooms. It's a, it's a big room, you know. It just you know. So I mean, just think something. I think we need to look as we go through the process. Obviously, you said it's the beginning of it, but I think it's just something we need to keep in mind. Is that you know we need to have some flexibility. <laughs> so no, that's that's perfect. For me, yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. That's all. So. Yeah, I really would like to thank you for the for the presentation, and I think everybody's comments were very very helpful. Um, and and I think we all agree that we want flexibility, and and we wanted to really meet the needs of the of community. And I really thank you for coming here and and having a an in person presentation. That was very it's, it's, very kind of you. It's it's rare to get to do this anymore, so yeah, it was fun. And and I do appreciate your comments, it's really important that you understand it and that you give me those comments, positive, negative, whatever it may be, it educates me. Um, but I thank you and, and it'll be fun to see this as we develop it. So, okay, I appreciate yeah. it, thank you. Yeah, thank you. thank you again, thank you. All right, I just want to, I want to note that we have so many um, of our, our library workers here because it is National Library Week and uh, I, I think we should give them a round of applause for all of the work that they do. Um, I hope that everybody has had a chance to visit some of the libraries. There's still time. The week is not over to visit the libraries and, and maybe check down where the bookmobile is because now the bookmobile, um, it seems like we had, uh, Alan had mentioned that there was a good response to the survey about where the bookmobile stops will be. So pretty soon, I'm sure, there will be a schedule of stops uh, that are available. Um, and I do want to note, and I want to thank uh, Joe Romano for setting up a, uh, really facilitating a meeting with the superintendent, the acting superintendent, um, Alda Raleigh, who we met in March, uh, and it really was very productive. I think the communication between the schools and the library will really continue to be strengthened. Um, so that's it for my report. Uh, now we will go to the financial reports. And did everyone have a chance to see the operating account? And were there any questions about the operating account? All right, hearing none, was there any questions about the capital account? Okay, and we had the North Edison account. 
and the payroll account. All right, so let's go to the bill list. Were there any questions or comments about the bill list? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, how many temporary librarians do we actually have? Um, because that's all I'm seeing on this most five pages of bill listing, the services of temp librarian. Um, some of them are the, are the same librarians because the way we're billed is one librarian for one week. So every one of those is one week and how many librarian. temp librarians do we have? Um, Deborah, um, how many would you say? Four? Yeah, four at the most. Four at most. Yeah, because that's, um, that's quite a lot on there. All right, um, I have other questions. Line 40 on the second page is $22,000. Can I take a look that's at that really one That's really jumping up is for gas. Uh, yes, that, remember, uh, if you look at the one above it, um, you remember we are, um, the way the bills came in, we are now dealing with, because we missed a cycle, that's why one is 22 and the one above it is four. If you look at uh, line 39. Yes, I see line 39, so. Where, which is. Why again is that one $22,000? I can um, double check that. I don't have the bills with me if you want and um, send you a copy of the bill in the morning. But why would that, it would be that high? I mean, for 4,000, you know, and then you got P, S, C, and G. Well, it, that is um, gas for Maine, electric for Maine, Northeast, and CB. And that um, reflects probably the last highest month um, but I can I can scan that bill and send it out to you in the morning. Yeah, if you could just you know double check it because sure. it just seems like it's a little bit, you know, high. Unless that's actually normal and it's just the way that it's showing up on the new system. Uh, it could just be the dates that we um, we had, but I'll scan those two for you so you can see them. All right, I think I had another question. Termination services, that's new. Um, what number, please? 102. Because this bill list, as you realize, is a mega bill list. 102. Well, for one month, isn't it? Just uh, The exterminating, we are also paying some old bills that were never paid. So what we've discovered is, and we've now started to tell anyone who has been mailing us bills to no longer mail us bills because we're not getting our bills. So that's why. And if you, um, those are actually uh, from 21 that were never, never paid. Oh. So we have one current and the rest are uh, from 21. Um, we, we, uh, <laughs> we only had one from, so far for this year. I'm glad, because usually we have more in the spring um, in all our buildings. The minute um, spring comes, all our buildings uh, end up being exterminated. We have um, usually uh, insects. Yeah, well, of course, you've got to do your due diligence, but I was just wondering why there are so many all at once. Oh, yeah, Ed, that's what it's from. They're not, it's just mm -hmm. this, not all this year. Okay, one other question I have. Um, PERS is a <coughs> pension, correct? Excuse me? PERS, PERS is the pension, correct? Yes. So we are actually Why do we do PERS reimbursement? Um, um, PERS reimbursement, two things. One, um, staff that um, left and, res and retired, two things. Staff that retired on uh, December 31st, their first check of 2023, PERS was taken out, and we've been told by the township that they are to be refunded. We had staff members who have left, their PERS was taken out um, at their final check. Um, the township has told us that um, that's to be reimbursed to them, and that the, any back pension would be picked up 
at their new location. So all of those PERS um, recommendations all came from uh, the township uh, PERS administrator. Oh, okay. I just don't remember seeing that ever before. Well, we never had that before. We are now, they <coughs> you have to remember, we're now doing our own paychecks and we're doing reconciliations. Previously, anything like that would have all been handled directly by the township. So now that we're handling our uh, paycheck, we now, uh, which is why on this bill list, um, we have a PERS um, reimbursement actually to the township um, who will pay PERS. Line on item it. 144, the PERS yep. payment. Yep, and there's a DCR payment as well. So that's, that's the other pension. <coughs> so we, these are um, uh, what we've been, been told by the township administrator um, with backup and notes. And Amanda's the one who works with the administrator. Um, and uh, that also goes for, say for example, um, uh, the librarians who had raises um, that began in January 1st, their PERS, um, uh, they all had to do back pay on PERS as per the township because not enough money was taken out because they're now making more this year. So just managing the PERS itself <coughs> isn't an ongoing, and I would say, you know, we get the quarterly reports and it usually is a couple of days worth of back and forth. Um, and so expect to see each quarter uh, any kind of reconciliation we're going to have to make um, uh, to the town because the town is um, reimbursing the, the town is paying the uh, PERS on our behalf to so the. We're re so we're reimbursing the town. I'm not going <coughs> to well, make no. any other comments about that. Well, no, we're actually, that's incorrect. Wow. Those are the, these are the PERS from staff members. So we're not reimbursing the town. We, that's, that's the employee's contributions. Well, the Township of Edison PERS payment of $36,000 is going to the township. Well we, well, we don't pay PERS directly. Right. We have yeah. to pay the town, and the town pays the bill. We don't have an account with PERS. That could fill the sports. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Okay. Because the town has to take the, em the employer's mm -hmm. and the employee's contribution and send that to PERS. Yes. Okay. And DCRP. Any other? Yes. I do. Um, right after where you were talking about line 146. I'm sorry, but line, I can't hear anything. Line 146. Um, AFSCME? Yes. Why are we paying anything to do with union dues? Because now the, the uh, uh, union dues come out of people's paychecks, and we have to pay AFSCME. Previously, it was done by the township. Okay, so this is so, so okay, I think it's going to take me a while to, to, to understand right. that all the, you know, the changes for, through uh, um, payroll will actually be seen in, in bill listing. Well, yeah, everything, uh, and after this, the um, union dues will be on a monthly basis. This was the first one, yeah. so it ended up being quarter. But the PERS payments expect to see on the quarterly basement, base, uh, basin, the union dues should be uh, given back to the, sent to the union every month. Okay, now I'm going to ask, I don't know if anyone else agrees with me on this. Is there a way for starting next month, since we're going to be having, like some of these bills will be for um, a payroll, if we can isolate the payroll bills in one section so that we can see what's, you know, like so we can see like operating expenses versus payroll expenses because they're so vastly different. Um, what I can do is I will then It'll run two me. batches. I don't know about anybody else. Um, the only way I can do that is to run two batches. So you'll have two bill lists. You can have a bill list that's run anything payroll related and a bill list that is operations related. Does anyone else have an opinion on this? I don't know if anyone minds. Because it's, it's either sorted alphabetically or it's sorted by PO number, which is meaningless as well. Exactly. Right. So it basically, this is the alphabetical, um, uh, this was actually done by, by PO number. Um, it does it alphabetically, but that might be the easiest way. We can run two batches of anything payroll um, related, could go on one bill list, and, and that's- Let's have a count of the payroll stuff, and then we'll just 
run it behind it. Um, can't do that. It's going to come on yeah, separate sheets. You're saying that it would have to be two separate it's, ones. Yeah, can't do it. If that's not a problem, I would appreciate that. I, I don't. I think uh, it's not a would. problem for me to do that. I'll just run two batches of uh, of the uh, report. It would just help to see which is which, because otherwise, looking at it, it just it seems a little. It, it's hard to understand, at least for okay. now. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay. Uh, yes, Tony. Um, Uh, we paid January already. Oh, okay. It was a previous. That was a previous. A previous this is for the. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Just curious. One other question on um, lines eighty and eighty-one, Jenkinson's Aquarium for three programs on eight twenty-two and eight fifteen. Are these for upcoming programs, or are we yes. that behind? These are for upcoming programs. Okay, so, so we're we have the checks. Yeah. So we're not behind. Oh no no no. Okay. We, you know, all what right, we're trying to, to do sure. yeah. for all the summer programs is get them all done, have all the checks in case there's any delay. Okay, I just wanted to double check. And okay. you have a lot that, there for telltale as well. I see that, well. yeah, tell-wise, yeah. Um, yeah, tell-wise, tell tell <laughs> 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 That's what happens when you look at this too many times. Uh, those are also all summer programs. Okay, good. Yeah. Right, Alan. Right, any other yeah. questions? Yes. Um, <laughs> so these are all vendors. You would consider them vendors because I see the Kwanzaa program, which was back in December. I'm sorry. The Kwanzaa program um, was never lines, paid. Uh, was never paid. So that was back from um, December. Yes. Are there other vendors that were that you're catching up on paying? And is there any way to identify them other than just you know having their name or anything like that? Well, I can. What I can do is um, I can run through this with an asterisk um, that, that will show if it's not, you know, a current within three months okay. um, after I run the uh, report because it basically comes out as an Excel spreadsheet. So I can always add to that um, description line. We can put a little um, note down there that says uh, previous bill or something like that. A, a previous bill and probably like the month it was supposed to be paid or the month that it occurred? Um, um, that, that would, well, no, I, I, mean, I can I do my that, best, but no. yeah, um, and I know that, that would all have that, to be done by hand. No, and I know that occurred in December. My question is, was that something that should have been paid through the township or is that? No, we would, we have been paying our own operating bills since September of 2021. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I'd like to move to approve. Excellent. Do we have a second to um, approve the bill list? Second. All right. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Okay. Uh, Ms. Krause? Yes. Ms. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Smead? Yes. Ms. Pam? Yes. Mr. De Pasquale? Yes. Mr. Patel? Yes. Mr. Alcantara? Yes. Mr. Romano? Yes. And Ms. Massey. Yes. A motion right. carries. So that has been approved. All right, now we'll move on to the director and the assistant director's reports. Uh, assistant director's report. Um, let me see. So discussion items for this evening. I did mention in my report um, that um, we have uh, uh, promoted our uh, former um, principal um, teen librarian to now the supervisor of uh, programs and services. Carolyn, you want to stand up? And so Carolyn has hit the uh, um, hit the ground running. And so for those of you who, Carolyn's job is to increase programming. Right. So <laughs> she knows that going into it. So, um, I mean, what it, what it does is centralize with someone on staff who can ensure that we have uh, programming not only across the three branches uh, and the bookmobile, but that we have um, increased programming for all ages, as well as to increase our outreach program. So um, uh, Carolyn is, you know, we're already into um, working much farther in advance 
uh, working three months in advance, which is why you see a lot of the summer programs already uh, on here on the bill list. So we've got a lot of the summer um, program um, up and running. The bookmobile update. Um, we have had several meetings. Um, we now have a almost, um, I would say, close to 99% route that we're going to, to do at this point. So the next um, two things we need to do is uh, get in the van and, and um, do the route and make sure that um, the route works um, and to uh, let all the um, uh, areas that we are going to stop at uh, know um, that we're going to be there and see if that's still okay and then do a final run with the bookmobile and make sure that the bookmobile has places to park. So our goal was next week. I think we probably will be the week after, but we're very, very close. Um, uh, as part of our National Library Week passports, um, we should, I guess we'll, by tomorrow everyone's going to know, right? So, um, we already had um, uh, two uh, visits. Yesterday was at the North Branch. Uh, today was at the main library. I think Miss Massey wins um, for the biggest checkout of anyone in any. <laughs> <laughs> I was really surprised to see all those bestsellers on the bookmobile. Well, that's I looked what there we're about, and I was like, oh we? my goodness, I can't believe it. Um, so yes, I would, I would suggest that you, when you see the bookmobile, stop, stop by and visit it. Um, and then, um, you know, I think everyone's enjoying it, both adults and children. Um, and um, we did uh, give out, this is our uh, giveaways for National Library Week. All of you... Um, uh, have a uh, new Edison Library Cup. Um, I won't give away all the secrets, but if you put some liquid in there, something happens. Ooh. And something happens if you hold that pencil for a, for a long time. It's good if you're in a good or bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> Margo's doing it. <laughs> She's checking. Meeting will go. Okay, we'll see. Is it? It it is. It will change color. It, the water actually is not blue, but the but the cup looks like it's blue. The kids love it. Um, um, the Library Foundation Friends of the Library book sale. Um, we I think we had a a great time last Saturday at the Clara Barton branch. Um, we raised over $260 um, with a lot of people excited that we were having the book sale and asking us um, when we'll have our next one. So we now um, have a continuous book sale at Clara Barton. So all three branches have a continuous book sale and that provides uh, uh, the uh, foundation uh, and the friends with seed money. And I think I mentioned in my report, um, we're very grateful to the foundation for uh, purchasing the gaming equipment for the library. Um, and they have also uh, told us they will um, provide us with monies for the summer reading club for prizes. So we're very thankful uh, for that. Uh, and we're continuing to work on the Friends of the Library um, spot on the website, and probably within a couple of days, um, more information about the Friends will be out. Uh, we had a, a really nice open house on Monday night at Clara Barton, um, and we had about 25 people. Uh, I would say most of the people I seem to, uh, and Deborah and I knew from Clara Barton, but definitely some new people. And these were all library users who love the library. I just did get one, one uh, suggestion. It wasn't about programming. It was about having more maker space kinds of things at Clara Barton so the person didn't have to go to Maine. And we told her that that's in the work. So we were very pleased with that. Um, and the folks that were there want to help us promote Clara Barton. So um, they have been getting the word out um, through their Facebook page. Um, I have spoken to our auditor, Bob uh, Budvilla. Um, 
the issue that was holding up our uh, 2021 audit uh, was the resolve that we needed to do with the town over unspent 2021 monies, which have now been returned uh, to the library and will be deposited uh, either tomorrow or Monday in the library's account. And so I expect uh, perhaps next, as early as next week, um, the draft of the 2021 audit, which I will forward on to the Finance Committee once I get that. Um, I already mentioned the uh, open house. Um, North Edison Branch construction project. Um, uh, Pat and I have had some discussions with our uh, uh, architectural firm, uh, Sage Arch. Um, we hope to meet with them early next week. Where we are at this point is um, basically going over um, budget numbers um, so that we can get some, some realistic figures um, based on what the contractors, I shouldn't say contractors, the engineers um, have given us. So we make sure that we have uh, a more accurate uh, budget. Uh, and um, we're going to be looking for uh, a construction manager um, for the, the project. So um, we're moving along. I hope when we meet on um, May 9th that we will have uh, a lot more information for the board um, on where we are and the next steps in the construction project. So that is uh, my report. Anything I missed, Deborah, that you want to add? We had a really good game day um, mid-April. Was it mid-April already? Caroline and I, and thank you, Robbie, for all of your help. We had about six officers come to help with the kids um, playing games. We gave out pizza. They played with the um, PlayStation 5, the Switch. We also played card games and Clue, which was very fun. Um, and then also today, I was on the Bookmobile for National Library Week, and we had, I didn't tell you this yet, we had a lovely couple, um, Marianne and Howard, who were at the open house, come by to see the Bookmobile. So that was very nice. Any other questions from the board in regard to anything in the report? We'd be more than pleased to, to answer. So I just have a question about the Bookmobile. Um, I know we just got this one, but what's the the uh, future outlook on, I know what last year we we're talking about, we're going to get another one, a bigger one, and you know, it was going to take us up to, what, 18 months or something. Where, where are we at well, with that? The, uh, the, the, we ordered the Sprinter. Right. So the Sprinter, we expect uh, probably based now on their production uh, in November. Oh, okay. And so how, how we have been planning the routes for, for this is the Sprinter is, a, is going to be more, say, for example, when we take a whole uh, truck of books, we take it, like the whole truck, put it on a lift, take it off, off into the facility, uh, for example, the nursing home or, the, or uh, the senior housing or Chelsea, and the librarian goes in with it, um, does a program, people get to choose books and whatever. Um, the uh, stops that we have chosen for here, except for one or two, are basically more like public stops in which people are going to get on. Now, this is where I am, and certainly it's too far as far in the future, um, is our expectation is based on the almost 300 people who responded to the bookmobile survey. Um, and the enthusiasm that people have for this, that we probably are going to need some other kind of mobile vehicle in the future. And we are thinking whether it is something that has computers on it for workforce development or make maker space on it that we could bring out all over the town. Um, so I think we want to get this started, get the sprint to started, and then kind of sit back for a couple of months and then if we come back to the board with a recommendation we want to be able to have more data i mean i also think that they're probably if we look for a, a, a third one that's a specialized one we're likely to 
perhaps find some grants, perhaps from the county or from the state, um, since it would be, you know, different kind of, of service that we were doing. So I would probably say, given the enthusiasm for what we have now, we're probably going to need a third vehicle because it does seem unlikely, who knows, I could be wrong, um, that we're not going to see another branch being built. Um, so are you, you thinking know. 24, 25 was what well, we get that Well, if we're one? thinking, well, it, we're going to get the other a vehicle in November. Right. So by then we will have been what? May, June, July, August, September, October, November. We have, have done this right. one for six months. We can get a sense almost like, what is it that people asking us? We, oh, I wish you had on this vehicle or I wish you could do more, or, you know, once we do, you know, once we really start doing more outreach, what does the community want that we don't know that they didn't really indicate to us in the strategic plan? Which is why I'm like, okay, so let's see what people are really looking for Right. that we're not providing. Yeah, I'm, I'm just bringing that up because we know the time frame. We don't know what the time frame of that third one could be. It could be 18 months again. So mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that we're, you know, we're, we have that outlook of when we're going to kind of consider, make maybe the end of this year, we, it, we look at really considering what's out there, what's the, you know, if that time frame works. I'm just it's, saying. It's, it's still you know. 18 months. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's still, it's, okay. I, and that's not changing because what happened is, there's still such a backup there is. Okay. with all the vendors that, um, and, and all of these vehicles are handmade. Right. Um, no, so true. that's yeah. why, you know, it's like, I went like, why does it take so long? Yeah. When I went there, I now realize why it takes three months to make a vehicle mm -hmm. um, with um, pretty much people working almost every day. Right. Because going out to the factory twice, you get to see the whole assembly line. It's a big, big right. to do. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. Great. But I'm pleased that you would like us to have another vehicle, Tony. <laughs> I've been excited about the bookmobile because the residents want it. That's what we've heard. So, you know, like I said, I just want to make sure we have that, you know, that's still in our outlook for, for that third one. So, good. Okay. Good. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank everyone. you, everyone. All right. We'll move on to the committee reports. <clears throat> the facilities committee um, met on April 13th. That was on Zoom. Um, and that was Tony and Jyoti. And, and uh, we met with Anthony uh, Iovino, who gave our presentation this evening. Um, so we had an idea of where the plans were going, the proposal was going for uh, Maine. Um, and then the finance committee, Sue. Do you want, I think yeah, we met on the twenty fifth, right? Do you want to do that? No, I'm doing, it, no, personnel. personnel. Okay, I'm doing finance. Yes, we met the same day on that, and we went over um, basically all the finances. Right. You know. Just right. That's basically it. About, you know the things in the bill, the things in the bill list, and um, you know the um construction that we're doing and how we have everything um, moved over as far as the banking is concerned. So we just basically just reviewed most of that, correct? That's it, yeah. that's it. And then personnel, Fiona? So it was a busy night, um, and we met on that same night. <laughs> um, and so the union has ratified the contracts, and that was done on the 30th. And we're just, the board needs to approve that. So the terms of the um, contracts is to align with the other contracts, so they're all parallel going forward. Right, right. And then the Policy and Bylaws Committee did not have a chance to meet, um, and there is a chance that we will have a quick meeting before May 9th, uh, and Strategic Planning Committee did not meet yet. All right, so we will move on to, we have no past business, we have new business. All right, you will recall that we eliminated the fines, um, the, the overdue fines, book fines, but we still had a $5 fine for a library card after the first time an individual lost 
our, their card. So I would like to make a motion that we eliminate the $5 fine for a library card after the first loss. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. Um, do we have any discussion or questions about that? No. All right, hearing none, could we have a roll call vote? Ms. Krause? Yes. Ms. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Mead? Yes. Ms. Pam? Yes. Mr. DeBasquale? Yes. Mr. Patel? Yes. Mr. Alcantara? <coughs> Mr. Romano? Yes. And Ms. Massey? Yes. The motion carries. All right, thank you. And then the next item, do we have a motion uh, to approve the firm of Supley, Clooney and Company, the CPA, to prepare the 2022 library audit for the fee of $10,600? Motion. Thank you. Second. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, could we have a roll call vote? Ms. Krause? Yes. Ms. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Mead? Yes. Ms. Pam? Yes. Mr. DePasquale? Yes. Mr. Patel? Yes. Mr. Alcantara? Yes. Mr. Romano? Yes. Ms. Massey? Yes. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Um, do we have a resolution to approve an agreement between the Edison Public Library and AFSCME Local 2020-04-1, those are the non-MLS staff, for the period of January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2024. So moved. All right, do we have a second? Second. All right, any questions or comments? All right. Madam Chair, yes. I just would like to comment. Yes. I, I liked Fiona's presentation, but I want to thank uh, the personnel committee. Um, and and uh, yeah, I know yours was very short, and you made it sound very easy, but it, it wasn't as easy as you made it sound. So you guys put in. I want to thank you guys and um, and Alan and Deborah uh, put in a lot of work. We had several meetings, and then there was time in between meetings. And just personally, I'd like to say that I, I appreciate. Mm -hmm how you know how easy you made the job thanks very much oh that's very nice that's very nice all right so now can we have a roll call vote please miss kraus yes miss o'neill oh yes <laughs> oh yes that's an oh yes uh miss mead yes miss pam yes mr de yes mr patel yes mr alcantara yes Mr. Romano? Yes. And Ms. Massey? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And then the last one, do we have a motion to close the Edison Public Library and the branches on Friday, June 9th, 2023 for the annual staff development part day? Definitely. Yes, I'll make that motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Lots of seconds. Lots of seconds. All right, we don't need any discussion about that. Um, roll call vote, please. Ms. Krause? Yes. Ms. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Mead? Yes. Ms. Pam? Yes. Mr. DeBasquale? Yes. Mr. Patel? Yes. Mr. Alcantara? Yes. Mr. Romano? Yes. Ms. Massey? Yes. Motion carries. All right, thank you very much. Madam Chair? Now, um, Madam Chair? Yes, sorry. Sorry, I was out of the room for resolution A. Is there, can I change my vote on the record to being an affirmative, please? Other than an abstain? I just had to abstain. I didn't know what we were voting on at the time. Oh, Everything. the one for the $5 fine for the library card? Yes. Yes, I don't see why not. Is that, I think that's okay. Sure. Yes. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we now have um, public comment. Do we have any public comment? I applaud you all for being here. I really do. It's wonderful. During National Library Week, too. All right, so now we have where we're, public comment is now closed. Um, 
Do we have any announcements? Uh, Madam President? Yes. Uh, probably three or four different things. Uh, please let the Board of Ed know about the prospective routes for the bookmobile. I want to make sure that that's put on the web, especially on our, our parental portal uh, and our website. Uh, number two, uh, we secured bids for the Herbert Hoover School uh, last Thursday. Uh, the bid came in at uh, 6.1 million. There was 13 uh, construction companies that bid on it. We have Thomas Jefferson, Woodrow Wilson, and John Adams going out to bid probably the end of this, the second week of May, I'll, I'll get that far. Uh, there'll be a, also J.P. Stevens will probably go out in July and there'll be a bid for uh, Edison High, all of which will have construction managers, which is something that I think everybody should have. So when we talk about, you know, 1.6 million, it's still a construction manager to take and actually take control of everything. Uh, we did that at the board. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank Alan for making sure that uh, I get the information that I needed and uh, for taking time out of, out of his busy day to take and come to the Board of Ed and uh, register some, some real concerns. Uh, I think I addressed one or two of them tonight, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we should be open together. In other words, everything that's going on at the Board of Ed and everything that's going on at the public libraries, we should be uh, open to making sure that our website is available to, to, the, to this library board. Uh, people do, re they do rely on that. And anything that we can do to help, uh, you just make sure that I know about it. I don't think there'll be any roadblocks, but if there's a roadblock, just give me a call. You have my phone number. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I do hope that at some point the bookmobile schedule is posted on the website or the route. That would be helpful. When it's finalized. Yeah, when it's finalized. Any other comments or announcements? Uh, I just want to. I would just want to note that not only is this National uh, Library Week, but April is. Um, Worldwide Autism Awareness uh, Month, and it's also Poetry Month, and it is School Library Month. Um, I did want to mention that. Uh, now, I do believe we do need to go into closed session um, at this time, so I will read that statement. Whereas the Open Public Meetings Act provides for the exclusion of the public at Board of Trustees meetings during the discussion of certain matters, and whereas prior to the exclusion of the public from a board of trustees meeting, it is required that the board adopt a resolution stating the general nature of the subject to be discussed and stating as precisely as possible the time when the minutes of the discussion conducted and in closed session can be disclosed to the public. And whereas this body is about to consider a matter which falls within the purview of NJSA 10 colon 4-12 and could properly exclude the public from such discussions. Now therefore be it resolved that the Edison Public Library Board of Trustees shall enter into a closed session to consider the following matters, contracts and legal issues. It is further resolved that the minutes of said discussion shall be made public as soon as the matter under discussion is no longer of a confidential nature. So <clears throat> do we have a motion to go into closed session? Motion. Second? Second. All right, so we are now in closed session.